Good morning, friends. My name is Claire Mitchell. I serve on Wednesday evenings with some of our youth girls. I'm going to be reading a portion of today's text. We're going to begin reading in Acts chapter 24, um, beginning in verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending his, to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who is Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And he, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he, first, he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Uh, I want to say uh, thanks to those of you who attended the Fall Roundup last week. It was cold, but we had a good time, and we ate well. Y'all did well on the side dishes and desserts. So uh, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, we have been in Acts for months now. So if, if you haven't been with us that whole time, uh, today at the beginning, I want to summarize a little bit for you. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 24, four weeks left, and then uh, we'll all be complete. We'll need to preach anymore. We've already gone through it. No. Uh, we'll move on to something else. We're probably going to look at the Ten Commandments, uh, which will be a, an exciting series. Uh, this study's been good for me, as you see, the development of the church the author of Acts is, is a man by the name of Luke. He authored the, the Gospel of Luke first, kind of telling the story of Jesus, his life, and his ministry. And then in Acts, he kind of picked up when Jesus ascended into heaven. Acts tells the story of how God built his church, how the church spread the gospel over the kind of the known world at the time. Now, just to give you a quick rundown of Acts, if you're not familiar, familiar with it, uh, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, like you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And, and exactly what, that's exactly what happened. These men who had all denied knowing even who Jesus was when he was arrested, I mean, they became faithful witnesses for the gospel. And so Peter, he preaches on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people are saved. And day after day after day after day, more people were being added to their number, more more people are coming to faith. Um, and then something happened there in Jerusalem. A man named Saul, who was opposed to believers to the way, he began to persecute Christians in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. He was binding them and carrying them off and putting them in prison. He stood giving approval unto the murder of a man named Stephen because he was a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, that persecution there in Jerusalem had the effect of scattering believers all across the known world, and they took their faith with them. And the gospel began to spread in little pockets all over that region. And then the, the disciples, they went out, and they took the gospel with them, sharing the gospel boldly in synagogues and on the streets, and wherever they could preach, the gospel began to take root. Now, kind of the recent history of Acts, we have the apostle Paul um, the man who once persecuted the church, he came to faith in Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. God appeared to him and everything changed. He went from the kind of the foremost persecutor of the church to its chief evangelist. <clears throat> now, God had spoken through his Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul. And he told him, I want you to go to Jerusalem and there um, bonds and afflictions await you. The Apostle Paul, in an extraordinary act of faith, he went to Jerusalem anyway. And just as God had said, Paul went into the temple. There, the crowds, they kind of rose up against him. They drug him out of the temple, and they began to beat him, intending to kill him. Uh, the apostle Paul was actually saved by a Roman soldier who was trying to kind of calm the riot. He brought him inside the barracks. He arrested him. And then they overheard a plot. The Jews weren't content with just beating Paul. They wanted him dead. And so there was a plot to kill him on his way to uh, his next trial. And so this Roman official, he was known uh, as the Tribune, he... He got 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to escort Paul to the city of Caesarea. And there he was going to stand trial before a man named Felix. Felix was a brutal man. Uh, he was actually adopted as a boy into kind of the royal home, if you will. Uh, he was raised as a son. He'd come to power. But they said he ruled like an orphan. 
He ruled like someone who had no power. He was brutal. He would crucify people and publicly torment them. So the Apostle Paul, that's where we're going to pick up today, he is standing trial before Felix uh, for sharing the gospel, for witnessing in Jerusalem. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pick up with me. We're going to be in Acts chapter 24, beginning in verse 22. <clears throat> Here's what it says. But Felix, now, uh, I, I didn't tell you the rest of the story, I'm sorry, but Felix here, uh, he's hearing the accusations made. Basically, they called for the chief priests and the elders to come down from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and they accused Paul of leading a riot, kind of leading an uprising, if you will, and of desecrating the temple. So the apostle Paul, he answers them and says, uh, listen, I've only been in Jerusalem 12 days. There's no way I led a revolt or an uprising. Or I didn't do any of that, and I certainly didn't desecrate the temple. So that's where we'll pick up now with Felix in Acts chapter 24, verse 22. But Felix, after hearing their arguments, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, these, this is of Christians, followers of Jesus, known as the way, having an accurate knowledge of the way, put them off saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, this is the guy that initially arrested Paul in Jerusalem, the soldier who kind of saved him from the crowds. He said, we're going to wait for him to come down. And we're going to hear his story. He says, when he comes down, I will decide your case. And then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So if you're the apostle Paul and you're standing for this brutal man named Felix, who other leaders of uprising have been crucified publicly, um, standing before him, you're hoping that you're not going to face the same fate as those who've gone before you. Paul was likely a little bit anxious about his fate, and yet it turns out really well for him on this day because the apostle Paul, he gets sentenced to house arrest. Like, that's nothing, right, compared to crucifixions. His friends get to come and tend to his needs. He gets to interact with them. This is really good news. And so um, Paul had something to celebrate. But that wasn't the end of the story. God was up to more things. Look what happened here in verse 24. It says, after some days, check this out. This is Felix, the brutal man. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was, a Jew, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul, and he heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. This brutal man and his wife are like, hey, we need to hear Paul talk about the gospel. This is like God putting the ball on the tee for you, right? Like I get people were asking me about the gospel. And so he did. He began to speak to these two about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about faith in our Lord. This is good news for him, right? This is a definite step up from crucifixion or house arrest. He's getting to visit now with the leader of this whole region, this very powerful man and his wife. Now, a little bit of background um, for what Paul's about to say. He's about to tell them, verse 25, it says, as he reasoned about righteousness, there's three things, righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. It says, Felix was alarmed. So this, this is pretty bold by Paul because he's, he's just really, he's telling the gospel. So the first thing, righteousness. Now, righteousness is the standard by which we're supposed to live, right? This is our right standing with God. God is the standard of righteousness. He's perfect in all of his ways. He's perfectly holy, perfectly just. That's what righteousness is. So the Apostle Paul, he starts talking to Felix and Drusilla about righteousness. Nothing wrong with that, right? Here's the righteous standard. Almost every uh, religion or society has had some form of righteous living, right? But then he tells them about self-control. Now, this would have been a little tougher for them to hear. As a part of God's righteousness, he requires that we act in self-control. The problem is that neither Felix nor Drusilla had lived lives of self-control at all. As a matter of fact, Felix had been through, uh, Drusilla was his third wife. He found the others to not be pleasing. He would choose another wife for himself. He was a man of lust. He pursued beauty. He pursued fame. That's who Felix was, not a man of self-control. And then there was Drusilla. When she met Felix, he was married, she was married to another man. And yet Felix had a little more prestige, a little more power, a little more wealth. And so her lust wasn't necessarily for Felix's beauty, but rather for his power and for his wealth. These two individuals had left their spouses. They lived lives, kind of reckless lives, pursuing the things that made them happy. And that's how they wound up with each other. The Apostle Paul, knowing that with just a word, he could be crucified, he could be beaten, he could be left in prison forever. He talks to them about God's righteous standard and then shows them how they've fallen short of that standard. And the final thing that he talks to them about is a judgment. And one day, it's true of us too, every one of us, Felix, Drusilla, you and me, 
are going to stand before God. And at the judgment, we're going to have to give an account for the lives that we live. Here's God's righteous standard. Here's how we live. We stand before God, and we've got to somehow give an account for that. Now, the problem for us is that every one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned, right? So when we stand before God, you're going to stand on the righteousness of one of two people. The first is your own righteousness. This is what Felix and Drusilla were feeling their own righteousness, or maybe you thought to yourself, well, if I do enough good things, that'll kind of outweigh the bad things in my life, or maybe you think of yourself as a pretty good old boy or a pretty good old girl, you're a good husband, a good dad, a good wife, a good mom, a good employee, a hard worker, whatever it might be, where we would try to say, you know what, I think this will make me acceptable before God. If I did these things, I came to church, I treated people well, I helped my neighbor, I, I cared for people when they were sick, all of these things that we would say, this is how I would justify myself before God. That's the position that Felix and Drusilla were in. The problem is that there is no one righteous. No, not one. Every one of us, the best one of us, has sinned and falls short of this righteous standard of God. So when we stand before him at the judgment, we give him all the good things we've ever done. If you sinned even once, you still fall short of his glory. And what you can anticipate, what Felix and Drusilla could anticipate, was an eternity spent in hell separated from God. But there's another type of righteousness that you can stand in. It's not your own righteousness, but it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did, he came to earth, he was born, uh, he, became, he took on flesh, he lived a perfect sinless life here in this world, and he went to the cross for you and for me, for the sins of the world. And so Jesus, he was crucified there on the cross, bearing the just punishment for our sins. And here's what happened for those of us who, who come to faith in Jesus Christ. You don't trust in our own righteousness. We don't give these stories that we're a pretty good old boy or a pretty good old girl or whatever thing you would try to justify yourself with, but instead you would say, I'm justified by nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I've trusted not in my righteousness, but in his righteous life that he lived on my behalf. What Jesus did there on the cross is he took all, of, for those of us who come to faith, he took our sin and he bore them. He bore the just punishment and he took that righteous, perfect life that he lived and he credited that to our account. It's true of us. God has a perfect, righteous standard. All of us have fallen short and one day we'll stand before God. Again, the question I would ask is, whose righteousness are you gonna stand in? the righteousness of Christ or the righteousness of you. Now, the problem here for Felix, he wasn't ready to trust in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he didn't trust in Jesus at all. Now, the, the, it seems like he must have been close. He understood the gospel. The gospel had the effect on him that sh it should have on every single one of us. It tells us here that he was trembling. Uh, this is verse 25. Felix was alarmed and said, go away at the present. Um, here's a man... The word alarm, by the way, in the Greek, it doesn't translate really well. It was, he was afraid. He was um, disturbed. The word actually means trembling. So here is this powerful ruler with his beautiful, noteworthy wife, and he's trembling before Paul, asking him, go away, I need to talk to you later. He recognizes where he stands before God, and he's trembling. Verse uh, there, there at the end of that verse, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So the apostle Paul goes back, house arrest, 29. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and he conversed with him. What Felix wanted was a bribe. He wanted Paul to pay him to let him out of prison. He's wrestling with the gospel and yet it's clear that he hasn't trusted Jesus. He's still acting wickedly. Man, Paul had been faithful, Right? Follow God, rode to Damascus, came to faith in Jesus. Man, he's gone to all of these places. He's preached the gospel with boldness. And he's loved God. He's endured suffering and beatings and imprisonment. And then he comes before Felix and Drusilla and he just proclaims the gospel with truth, not even caring about his own life. And most of us would think that the way that this story would end is that, you know, Felix and Drusilla, they got saved and Paul lived happily ever after. But there's a really troubling verse here. As a matter of fact, in the next verse, you're going to see two full years encapsulated with nothing but a sentence. Now remember, Luke was trying to compile an account of all that God had done in building up his church. He's focused on Paul. But for the next two years, we get a single verse. It describes very little of what happened. Look here in verse 27. It says, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. 
and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So he was really faithful in sharing the gospel, right? And Felix and Drusilla, they heard it, and he was trembling with fear, and it looked like he was just about to give his life to Jesus, and the whole region was going to have a just and righteous ruler, but that didn't happen. And instead, Paul sat in prison for two years. And the next guy came and left him in prison even then. What I want to talk to you about today is what do we do when God delays what do we do when God allows difficulties into our lives and we're praying, God, would you remove this thing? God, would you heal the sickness? God, I desire to have a spouse. Would you bring a godly man or woman to me? God, I want to be married. Or maybe other desires that you have that are righteous desires and you're praying to God, God, would you rescue me from this? Would you give this thing to me? God, finances are difficult and I'm trying my best, and I'm working hard. I need you as the Jehovah Jireh God. Would you provide for me? What do we do when God delays? How do we as the people of God who trust him as our Lord and our Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we're asking, and we're praying, and we're hoping, and we're waiting, what do we do when God delays? Now, before I get into the specifics, I need to be really clear about something. God is never late. God doesn't get distracted handling things with other people or dealing with the important issues around the world and he maybe forgets what's going on with us. The truth of it is, is that our God, he knows everything that is happening in the life of every single person, in every single city, in every single state, in every single country, every single continent of the world, and he understands all of that at the same time. God is never late. God never misses our concerns or our issues or our prayers or our problems. Delay is what it feels like on our end because we don't understand God's perfect plan. When circumstances arise that are beyond our control, when things happen that we can't fix, when needs are present that we can't meet or desires go unfulfilled, what we're often tempted to do is think that, to believe that God doesn't care, that God isn't concerned, maybe God's angry at us, God doesn't want to work on our behalf, but that couldn't be further from the truth. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we are loved and adopted by Jesus Christ. He loves us and he wants the absolute best for us. So again, I ask the question, what do we do when God delays uh, the first thing that I want you to see here, number one, is we remember the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over everything in every place all at the same time. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the most high God. God is the God that spoke everything that we know and see into existence. He created us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He is intimately acquainted with us in our deepest desires. God knows and God sees, and yet we trust in his sovereignty. Look what the Apostle Paul has to say. This is Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? God doesn't come and ask us like, hey, Jason, I'm not sure what I should do here. What do you think I should do? God knows his thoughts, his ways. He is higher than us. His judgment's inscrutable. His riches, his wisdom, his knowledge are far beyond us. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, when life hits us in the mouth, when God seems to delay, when we don't know what he's doing, there's difficulties facing us, what do we do? When we remember that God is sovereign, even over our specific circumstances, God knows what we're going through. And we choose to trust him. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even we don't, when we don't see how God is working, we choose to trust him. See, from our vantage point, it doesn't always seem like God knows what he's doing. And that happens a lot to me. I don't know how you live, but it often seems like, God, what are you doing? 
God, I think really what you ought to do is make me handsome and healthy and life. I'm really gifted and talented and everything comes easily. That's what I believe. But if that were true, I wouldn't be very dependent on the Lord, would I? I wouldn't know him and have a depth of relationship where the difficulties of my life drive me to my knees such that I know the provision and the goodness of God. We will either trust in God's sovereignty or we won't. But either way, God's sovereign plans will be accomplished. We can trust him or we can worry and be fearful. We can trust him or we can fight against him. Uh, a few weeks ago, I took my family to Cedar Lake. Uh, it's a good family day. My kids don't love it, but we went anyway. And so we're out at Cedar Lake, and we're going for a hike. And really, nobody in my family likes to hike but me, but we're going. And so uh, the kids ask, hey, can we bring the dogs? And so I was like, sure. Uh, Y'all, I have a dog. Her name is Lily, and she loves me. I'm her favorite. I mean, if, if there are 100 people around, she's coming to see me. Lily loves me. She was supposed to be a duck dog, but she's gun shy, so... That was a lot of waste of training. But anyway, Lily is a wonderful dog. She's starting to get a little gray, and man, she's just awesome. Now, the thing about Lily, I worked really hard with her when she was young, and so she's really good on a leash. By the way, Worcester Lake, or I'm sorry, Cedar Lake, you have to have your dogs on a leash. And my dogs don't live on a leash. We don't have a fence. We don't have leash. They just run, right? So it's a little challenging for us, but we took the dogs. I put Lily on a leash, and man, she's awesome. She's so good. I'm just walking with her on that leash, and she's not pulling ahead, like trying to, you know, run down the trail too fast. And she's not lingering behind or, you know, veering off the edge. She just walks like step for step with me. She stops every now and then, kind of acknowledges me because she loves me, you know. And we just, man, it was just a wonderful little hike there with Lily because she's awesome. But I also have another dog, my daughter's dog. His name is Toby. And he's like a big lumbering male, right? Uh, he's, maybe he's smart. He just doesn't exhibit it a lot. But he's, anyway, he's not well-trained. So here at Cedar Lake, we are trying to keep our, you know, not at least make a big scene of our, ourselves. And so we put Toby on the leash, and Toby doesn't get it at all, right? So Toby's like running down the trail ahead and like dragging him or dragging me, uh, or he wants to go back and check out something we passed, or he's going down into the water because there's something cool down there. And let me just tell you, at the end of that hike, we were exhausted, like trying to deal with him. Like he was a huge pain, to be honest with you. Never kept step, always wanted to go his own way. You know what? God is leading us down a path and he wants to walk right with us. But many times when we can't see what's happening, we don't know what God's doing, we're like that silly dog of mine always trying to get ahead of God or we're pulling back behind or maybe we're afraid, we want to check something else out and God's like, hey, just walk right here with me. I've got you and I'm leading you. I want to walk with you. I want to lead you every step of the way. And for us, we just acknowledge the sovereignty of God. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what his plans are. And rather than spending our lives in worry or fear or anxiety, we just take one step at a time, wherever he would lead us, trusting in his timing instead of ours. So what do we do when God delays? We remember his sovereignty, his power, his goodness. Listen, we can trust the God who died on the cross that we might live. We can trust the God who suffered and bled and died that we might truly live. He is leading us. He is guiding us. Our God is good. We can trust him. So what do we do when God delays or it feels like it? We trust in his sovereignty. The second thing we do, we remember that delay does not necessarily equal Denial. Now, let's be honest. God doesn't give us everything we ask for. But for the things that we know, that maybe God's given us these desires. I remember being as a young man in like, ministry, and there were lots of things that I desired. And I found myself working um, as an intern at a church in Stillwater. I didn't even like my youth pastor. I'll just admit that now. It was tough, you know. I'm like, God, what are you doing? I, I thought you called me to ministry, and here I am working for six bucks an hour. And I'm a college graduate, you know. It was tough. But God's delay does not always equal God's denial. In John chapter 11, there's a story. Three friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And they, had, they weren't just kind of like a you know, passing relationship. They loved Jesus, and Jesus loved them. They had a close relationship. Now, it just so happens that Lazarus had become ill. 
So Mary and Martha, they, they knew Jesus. They loved Jesus. They knew that he could heal, so they sent word to Jesus as quickly as they could. Jesus, like, you need to come because Lazarus is sick. We need you in this situation. We need you to come here. And there's this crazy verse in John chapter 11, verse 6, that if you've ever just kind of sat down and read the Bible, honestly, honestly you've probably thought, what in the world? John chapter 11, verse 6 says, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, this is Jesus, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And you read it and you're like, why would you do that? What are you doing, God? Why would you wait? As a matter of fact, when Jesus finally made his way to Bethany, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha were, Lazarus had already died. And both Mary and Martha, they said the same thing to him. Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. If you just would have hurried, or if you wouldn't have just delayed for a few days, Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus would not have died. Jesus says something to them that, oh, if we could just grasp this and, and live this as people of faith. Chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? If you will trust me, if you will believe, you will see the glory of God. God will work this circumstance for his glory. What Mary and Martha didn't know as he wept with him there is that Jesus was going to go right to the place where Lazarus was laid. He's going to say, Lazarus, come forth. He raised him from the dead. And this was quite a new experience for Mary, Mary and Martha. They trusted Jesus to heal. They'd seen him do that. Man, the lame walked, the blind saw, the deaf could hear. Like Jesus had done that before. But they'd never seen him raise the dead. If you believe, you would see the glory of God. If you will just trust me, just wait on me, I'm going to show you the glory of God. You're going to experience it. You're going to see it in your own life. In the delay... Jesus was demonstrating his sovereignty over every situation, over every circumstance, and over everything. Listen, I'm not just sovereign over sickness. I'm sovereign over death. Watch what I can do. Just trust me, and I'm going to lead you to a place of life and fullness and abundance. Will you just trust me? The delay that feels like a kink in our plans is a part of God's sovereign plan. God is working all things for his glory. On that day... The blessing that they received, they got a big miracle. I mean, that's, that's like grade A, right? That's, that's like the top level miracle when you raise a man from the dead. Lots of people saw Jesus heal. They got to see Jesus raise a man from the dead. They saw the glory of God. As long as God's in the picture, no matter how dire your circumstances, no matter how deep the hole, there is always hope when God is in the picture. So when God delays, we trust in his sovereignty. We remember that God's in control and that he's good and he's working on our behalf. And remember that delay doesn't always equal denial. Sometimes God wants to show us more glory through the difficulty that we're enduring. The final thing here, uh, when God delays, we remember that God's delay is discipline and it's for our good. Now, we stand up here every week in this church and we say, our mission is to lead all people, that includes you, right, to, lead, to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus. That means that we love God with our whole hearts, that our whole lives are about him. They're lived in submission to him. If we want to make disciples, we should expect discipline, right? Like, think about those two words. They're, they go together. You can't be a disciple without discipline. We're obviously not where we should be yet. I'm not where I want to be in terms of full devotion to Jesus. It is his discipline that draws us nearer to him, that helps us know him more. If discipleship is our goal, then discipline should be expected. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one that he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. In verse 11, it says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. And a few amens go up, right? Painful rather than pleasant, amen. There are difficult circumstances that we're walking through and it feels painful rather than pleasant. Don't miss the, the, the reality of that in your own life. It's painful. But he goes on to say, 
but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And you want to know the glory of God. You want to know his goodness. It is discipline that leads us to know God more, to love him more, to loosen our grip on the empty things of this world and instead to cling more closely to Jesus Christ. That is a discipline. When God delays, maybe the only reason he delayed is that he could teach you something. He could teach you to cling to him, teach you to pray, teach you to trust it's for us, and it is God's expression of love. And he's the one in control. We're just following after him. And sometimes on that journey, we have to trust him through difficult ups and downs and difficulties. But he's teaching us. There's a verse that, uh, I don't know, if you've ever played sports, ever competed, you probably have, like, quoted it before. Or if you love Tim Tebow, he put it in his eye black, you know. It's Philippians 4.13. We love that verse, don't we? It's like the one you want above your door as you're leaving, you know, like, for, listen, if, if, if we're believers in Jesus, we want to like live that well, right? Like, man, we want to be, y'all know what Philippians 4.13 says, right? For I can do all things through Christ. He strengthens me. Boom, like we want that power, like God bring it on. And yet, as, as people of faith, we have a responsibility not to misuse the Bible for our own ends. Rather, we view scripture in context and we see what it really means. The Apostle Paul who said, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he gave us a little bit of context for that. And this is Philippians chapter four. We're gonna be in, begin in verse 11. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned, circle that word, right? You're studying your Bible, circle learned there. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned, right? Circle that again. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know how to make it when God delays the good, the bad, the ugly, the circumstances that are far beyond your control? We learn as we walk through those circumstances to trust in Jesus Christ that we can do it through him who strengthens us. You know how Apostle Paul made it in times of plenty? And that's pretty easy, right? When life is good and everything's perfect, plenty of money, everybody's healthy, life is great. Like, we know how to make it there, right? But I've learned how to live when things abound, but also how to make it when I'm in need, when I'm hungry. When I'm broke, when life is brutal and I can't seem to make it through, I've learned how to do that. You know how Paul learned it? He endured it. Beatings and imprisonment and loneliness and hunger and all the things that come with having very little. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ empowers you to walk every step of the path that he is leading you on. And not only that, He's working all of that. Every step you're taking on that difficult path, every moment of delay, he's working it for his glory and for your good. Strengthening you, growing you. You know how to learn how to be content in any circumstance? Go through some circumstances. That's how you learn it, right? Tony Evans, uh, kind of known preacher and teacher, he says, if you're going to learn to believe God at a deeper level, which we all want to do, you're going to have to go through a deeper situation greater trust, greater faith, following after Jesus, even in the midst of difficulty. God delays because he wants us to see him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to follow him and walk with him, even through difficult times. The psalmist, Psalm 4610, he said, be still and know that I am God. Sometimes, in the midst of all the busyness and all the chaos of our life, we just stop we get in a quiet place and we remember that he's God. He's sovereign over everything and that we can trust him. His timing is perfect. We're the ones who need an adjustment. Can I say that again? God's timing is perfect. We're the ones who need adjustment. Learning to trust God is difficult when you can't see how things are gonna work out. But we serve a good and loving God. God, who faithfully leads us. Romans 8, 28, you've probably heard this, you know it. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. 
you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will face difficult moments. You will face times where it seems like God isn't listening. He's not responding. He doesn't hear you. But he does. There are times of delay. And ultimately, they're for God's glory and for our good. Would you bow with me? Father, we, we just praise you for your word and your spirit who gives us eyes that see and ears that hear. Father, we pray that you would make us fully devoted disciples. Those areas of our life where we're prone, we're given to fear or worry or anxiety that we don't trust you. Father, would you gently lead us? Help us to know you more fully, to trust you with our whole hearts. Now, would you make us pleasing to you? May we will live righteous lives not in the weakness of our flesh, but in the power of your spirit. Would you make us steadfast in our faith in you? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.